Hi folks, so we're going to get started. Uh, we're going to continue our Essentials in Liver Transplant uh, lecture series by the Liver Fellows. And uh, Rob Mitchell is going to uh, discuss vascular and biliary complications. Thanks for coming. Okay. So thanks everybody uh, for coming today. Um, I'm excited to give this talk. I think it's an important topic that, um, you know, we in uh, the medical side of liver transplant don't always get exposed to um, at every time point. I think we often see the, the late consequences of, of some of these complications, uh, but, but many of the sort of early complications in the vascular and, and biliary realm are typically dealt with uh, the surgeon. So I, I was very excited to review and read about this topic and now uh, present it to you all. So thank you for your you attention. Provide further exciting opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> After Christmas in the new year. So uh, this is the outline of the talk today, and, and I want um, people to leave the talk today with, with a, a general understanding of, of the anatomy uh, of a patient after a liver transplant. This is essential in understanding the complications that can occur from a vascular and biliary perspective. And then the goal of the talk is to hit the most common complications in each of these realms, focusing on the most common way that these present, um, and having some approach to uh, diagnosis, uh, treatment and then an idea of, of uh, the prognosis for some of these complications going forward. I do have disclosures, unfortunately none that are financial. Number one, I'm, I'm not a surgeon and the point of this talk is again not, not for surgeons. Any discussions around surgery here are, are given in the context um, to help us understand uh, more on the medical side how to, how to deal with these things. Number two, I'm from Canada. so. Please forgive any uh, abnormalities in speech, uh, or, or if I start apologizing profusely, let's just ignore that, okay? So to begin with an anatomy review, um, just uh, on a very basic level, um, this is a, a schematic of what uh, the, the vascular and biliary anastomoses uh, may look like after a liver transplant. Um, liver transplant requires at minimum three vascular anastomoses and, and very frequently more. Um, so, you know, there, there will be one anastomosis at the hepatic artery from the donor hepatic artery to the recipient hepatic artery. There will be one anastomosis, uh, let me just see if, uh, at the uh, uh, portal vein, again, from the recipient to the donor. And you'll have at least one vascular anastomosis uh, in the outflow. Uh, and very frequently more than one, and, and I'll talk about some of the variability that can occur there. And this has important implications in uh, vascular complications of uh, hepatic outflow after liver transplant. Uh, uh, finally, there's some variation in the biliary anastomosis, and I'll, I'll talk about that, uh, because that also has some uh, important consequences in um, complications after transplant. So I'll come back to this, but I just wanted to establish these two um, uh, hepatic outflow anastomoses before we get started, because I'll be using the term uh, piggyback throughout the talk, and I want you to know what I'm talking about. So what I'm showing you here is uh, the two most common uh, ways that an IVC anastomosis will be made um, by the surgeons. So this is sort of the classic or intercable connection. Um, this is what's uh, favored by most surgeons and the majority of, of transplants that are done in deceased donors here at Sinai are done with an intercable connection. Um, the donor will have part of their IVC grafted to the recipient uh, IVC, both uh, uh, in a superior and inferior anastomosis. So in this patient, you would have four vascular anastomoses, this IVC and then artery and portal vein. Um, Alternatively, this is a piggyback connection. This is uh, done in, in live donors. This is done in split grafts. And, and occasionally, this is done in deceased donors for a variety of factors. Um, but the, the anastomosis here actually occurs between the uh, donor uh, hepatic vein and the recipient hepatic vein. Uh, uh, and you have one anastomosis, and it, is, uh, it does not involve the direct IVC. And I'll talk about the implications that has later. And just to, to quickly define the two biliary anastomoses we can see after liver transplant, by far the most common is the duct-to-duct -duct anastomosis, um, or if uh, you prefer Latin, the colidoco colidocostomy. And uh, this is uh, one connection from donor to recipient uh, bile duct. Uh, 
and uh, this is the, the vast majority of connections that we see. However, in some patients, um, particularly those that have uh, previous underlying uh, extrahepatic biliary disease like PSC or prior biliary surgery, um, or occasionally some size mismatch in the recipient and donor bile ducts, uh, you may see um, a coli doco jejunostomy performed, um, typically with a rule limb. And what a rule limb is, is a, a limb of bowel that's, that's uh, brought up, usually a, a jejunal limb, and connected directly to the uh, uh, donor common hepatic duct. So you have a direct donor to uh, recipient enteric connection. Mm -hmm. So these are the two different uh, types of biliary anastomoses we can have. And I'll speak later about why this is important and the implications this has uh, in assessing complications. So now into the, to the meat of the talk. So starting with vascular complications uh, of liver disease. And I want to go through this again, not, not hitting every single complication, but talking about those that are most common and those that we're most likely to see uh, both in the early and late phase after transplant. So, Starting with arterial complications, um, I want to talk uh, about the most common complication, uh, vascular complication after liver transplant, and, and often the most devastating, which is hepatic artery thrombosis. I'll then touch on hepatic artery stenosis and a brief word on hepatic artery pseudoaneurysm. It's important to remember that the hepatic artery provides blood supply to both the liver parenchyma, which has dual blood supply. Remember, it gets the majority of its blood supply from the portal vein. Um, but the arterial supply is unique and important, particularly in liver transplant, because it is the sole uh, blood supply to the biliary tree. Um, and this has very important implications after, after transplant if you have something like uh, stenosis or thrombosis in the hepatic artery. So hepatic artery thrombosis, as I mentioned, is uh, the most common vascular complication uh, of liver transplant. Um, most commonly, this will occur at the arterial anastomosis. Um, this is a, a cartoon or schemata of, of um, you know, hepatic artery uh, um, anastomoses that we can have. So the proper hepatic artery from the uh, recipient joined to the donor hepatic artery. So you, you'll most commonly see a, a thrombus forming here. Um, the incidence of this is variable and, and probably is changing over time, um, depending on the case series you look at. Um, you can have you can have a, a bit of a range in incidence. Um, one of the largest case series of um, of pooled uh, twenty over twenty thousand uh, patients shows uh, a rate of early hepatic artery stenosis or sorry thrombosis as defined by occurring within thirty days from transplant of three percent. Um, there is a case there are case series from the nineteen eighties that that show a much higher uh, incidence of this. And, and why this is decreasing is not entirely clear, or is not entirely clear to me from reading the, the literature, but I suspect is related to, to technical factors, uh, you know, surgeon experience, and um, experience with, with uh, pre and post transplant care at large transplant centers. So I alluded to this, but there is a, a distinct clinical uh, difference between early and late hepatic artery thrombosis. And this is something that, that, that a theme that you guys will see through many of these complications I'm going to discuss. Uh, early and biliary uh, complications are different, and it's important to make this distinction. So early hepatic artery thrombosis um, more commonly is associated with technical or surgical issues. Uh, it tends to be more acute, and it tends to have a more uh, severe course when compared to late hepatic mm -hmm. artery thrombosis. Uh, importantly, this can progress to, to fulminant hepatic necrosis and uh, liver failure that, that will require urgent retransplantation. As I mentioned, this, is, this, is typically, uh, this condition early is typically associated with worse outcomes than late hepatic artery thrombosis. Uh, conversely, late hepatic artery thrombosis may be more related to immune or immunologic phenomena, uh, um, which I'll, I'll go into more detail on. Um, many of these patients actually present asymptomatic, and, and this may be picked up only with uh, elevated liver enzymes on regular labs. Frequently, these patients will have biliary complications, and they may present that way. Um, this is not to say that early uh, hepatic artery thrombosis patients do not have do, um, but, but this is a common presentation <laughs> of late hepatic artery thrombosis. And this is a more insidious presentation, may have a, may have a more mild uh, clinical course than early. <clears throat> 
So I, I want to, again, stress this, that the early uh, clinical syndromes from hepatic artery uh, thrombosis are, you can have some uh, variability and there can be a gradient. The most important one uh, for us to be aware of as, as post-transplant physicians is uh, fulminant, uh, fulminant hepatic necrosis following hepatic artery uh, thrombosis. So this will typically occur very soon after transplant. Um, it'll be heralded by a sharp rise in hepatocellular numbers. Um, and, and many of these patients will actually qualify for urgent retransplantation. I mean, I'll, I'll discuss the criteria for that. Um, but there, there are well-defined criteria for, for which of these patients should be uh, retransplanted here in the, in the United States. Um, Patients, as I alluded to before, can also present with biliary complications, and um, this, this may be heralded by recurrent sepsis, bacteremia. Um, you can have disruption of the bile ducts and development of bile duct leaks, uh, which can cause biomas, uh, cholangitic picture. And again, both of these conditions have high rates of uh, mortality and, and poor outcomes if not intervened upon. And much less frequently in the early phase, you can have an asymptomatic uh, liver enzyme uh, elevation picture. It'll, uh, more commonly, you'll have a, an actual clinical syndrome that is tipping you off to this. Um, so I, I briefly want to just touch on some of the, the risk factors that are established in the literature. Um, there, there are a lot of studies looking at this, um, and many divided into, into technical or surgical factors, and then recipient or donor factors. As I mentioned, the technical and surgical factors uh, are, are more important when it comes to early hepatic artery thrombosis. Um, so this may be related to, to size mismatch or, or problems with the size of the hepatic artery. Uh, there's a higher rate in less experienced uh, surgical volume centers or prolonged OR time. Um, there's there's uh, some suggestion that, that prolonged cold, cold ischemia time uh, may predispose patients to, um, to hepatic artery thrombosis, but this may be a later hepatic artery thrombosis than, than early. Um, as far as patient and uh, you know patient recipient and patient donor factors, uh, CMV is uh, CMV <coughs> mismatch is an important uh, condition to be aware of, um, and uh, you know as as I alluded to, immunologic and inflammatory phenomenon uh, tend to be associated with more late hepatic artery thrombosis. So you th see things like cigarette smoking, a hypercoagulable state, uh, prior taste, various uh, risk factors that can disrupt the uh, you know, the, the endothelium and, and uh, predispose somebody to forming a clot. So how do we screen for and diagnose this? Um, in one case series, that the medium, median time to detection of early hepatic artery uh, thrombosis is uh, 6.9 days, and it's, it's much later for uh, late hepatic artery thrombosis. So I think because of this, and, and for some other complications I'm going, going to mention, um, many centers perform a regimented uh, post-liver transplant screening with Doppler ultrasound. And I wish we had a, a surgeon in the room to kind of let me know exactly what our, our protocol is here. Maybe that's something we can talk about a, a little bit later. Um, but uh, this is important because it can, you know, can help us pick up on some of these vascular complications early. Um, what we'll see on the Doppler ultrasound is a lack of vascular uh, signal in the hepatic artery, um, or you may see an elevated resistive index. Sometimes this can be actually heralded by a gradually decreasing resistive index. If someone's had multiple uh, ultrasounds, this would indicate a, a progressive hepatic artery stenotic picture. And finally, when that resistive index shoots up or you lose your signal, that may be a, a thrombus present. Um, to confirm the diagnosis, we need angiography, uh, either non-invasive angiography, either with CT angiogram, MR angiogram, and very rarely uh, percutaneous or direct angiography. And this is an, another theme you'll see throughout this talk, is that this screening with uh, Doppler ultrasound followed by angiography is, is a very uh, almost universal way to, to diagnose vascular complications uh, post-liver transplant. Uh, oh, just there, yeah. Just yeah, yeah. Some of the techniques that I've seen surgeons use, they start to see an elevator resistive index. It's basically aimed to try to reduce congestion of the graft. Mm. Uh, so things like trying to diabetes the patient a little bit, uh, using calcium channel blockers on treated time, just to sort of slow the inflow into the graft uh, to try to uh, not necessarily prevent uh, thrombosis, but improve stenosis, for example. Mm. Too much flow 
So they use they they actually use this marker and you know to apply exactly. some medical therapy. Yeah. yeah. Whether this data, I think, I think that's <laughs> yeah. Sure it's more theoretical and those are the things that sort of try to prevent early attacks. So I, I, I want to touch on sort of the menu of treatment options that we have for these patients. Um, so revascularization is one option, and this can either be done um, endovascularly, and by that I mean by IR, basically through, through a variety of techniques, which I'll, I'll briefly touch on, um, or we can have surgical revascularization where the patient is actually open for exploration and, um, you know, angioplasty or, or um, thrombectomy is applied surgically. Um, in more extreme cases or in those very acute um, cases, retransplantation may be required. And in some cases, we can simply uh, observe. And there's significant variability in practice. And, and how we treat this really depends on how early or late uh, we're discovering this and whether the patient is symptomatic or non-symptomatic. Um, mm -hmm. These panels illustrate some of the uh, endovascular techniques that can be applied. So this is a reconstructed CT. You can see this is the, uh, the, the um, patient's hepatic artery proper, suddenly have decreased blood flow, which indicates a clot is there. On direct angiography, you see that uh, confirmed no blood flow or, or hyperdensity beyond this point. Um, in C, uh, the patient has actually undergone a, a, a catheter-directed TPA, um, dose of TPA for thrombolysis at the site of that clot. And then in panels uh, D and E, you see the, um, the interventionalist has applied stents. So this is a, a common way that we can see hepatic artery thrombosis and stenosis being dealt with um, endovascularly by IR. So going back to our treatment approach, so I mentioned it, it can be different depending on whether this presents early, late, and symptomatic versus non-symptomatic. So for patients who have early hepatic artery thrombosis, yeah, please. I have a, I have a slide on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, so so most striking uh, presentation, as I mentioned, is fulminant uh, hepatic necrosis, and uh, you know we have a established set of criteria that would qualify somebody for. Uh, for retransplantation in this scenario. Um, so this has to occur within seven days of their initial liver transplant. Uh, we have to see an AST that is greater than 3,000, and then one of uh, those four criteria, basically you know, uh, markers of, of uh, acidosis with mounting lactate and synthetic dysfunction with elevated <laughs> INR. And interestingly, in the, in the finer print um, of some of these policies, you, patients who do not meet this, this 1A criteria can apply for, you, you, you may apply for uh, basically exception points to be listed at MELD 40. Um, I'm not entirely clear on this, but I suspect it's, you know, many patients who might be outside of that seven day window or don't quite, quite meet this criteria, but, but need a transplant in order to, uh, you know, have good outcomes going forward. Uh, of course, these patients need critical care support and, and empiric broad spectrum antibiotics until you until you get them to transplant. Um, in the early phase, so patients who I've, I've written asymptomatic, as I mentioned, you know, patients are rarely completely asymptomatic with early hepatic artery thrombosis. But if they, you know, have a, uh, you know, elevated liver numbers or, or signs of portal hypertension or, or signs of liver failure, but but aren't needing a, a transplant, uh, revascular revascularization may be attempted. Um, and this is using some of the options that I that I described on the previous slide. So we have intraarterial thrombosis, thrombectomy. Stent placement. There are risks that come with these uh, procedures, um, of course. And then finally, we have uh, surgical exploration, revision, and, and thrombectomy. And if these things don't work, uh, we, uh, you know, have to move on to retransplant many of these patients. And so one of the things here is that the surgeons very often prefer actually to move right to retransplant. Mm. You, you know, you, you can't really predict the downstream effect of some transient stenosis treatment. You know, you were talking about earlier about like cold ischemia time, right? I'm not sure cold ischemia time is associated with thrombosis as much as it's associated with ischemia, mm -hmm. right? And you can't really predict that if patients have protracted um, hypotension, say, in the operating room, the same thing could happen. So the, the surgeons very often prefer just to move to retransplant the patient because 
the patient may have already suffered a biliary insult and then try to revascularize them, you're sort of stuck if they have already developed right. biliary. You've revascularized, but you haven't dealt with the biliary issues right. that, that you're now left with. Yeah. Um, um, I'll just point out, I yeah. do this every year for mm -hmm. the fellows. It's one of the few requirements for a prognostic model that has transamase elevation. Mm. Right? So, yeah. how many scores have you seen ASD as a thing? Yeah, no. ALT immediately. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. Right. So I will. Um, I'll move on. I'll, I'll, I'll discuss late uh, hepatic artery thrombosis a little bit. Um, so again, we have to define whether these symptoms are these patients are symptomatic or asymptomatic. Um, the symptomatic patients uh, may present with poor graft mm -hmm. function, biliary complications, um, and these patients, as we just discussed, you fix one problem, so you know you revascularize them, and you're still left with accumulated biliary or infectious concerns. And, and many of these patients will require uh, retransplant if if they are presenting with recurrent uh, cholangitis or myelomas. Um, some patients will, you know, potentially have late hepatic artery thrombosis. Will have maintained graft function. Will not have biliary complications. And uh, these patients may be fortunate enough to have developed some arterial collateralization. Um, there's some, I was reading, uh, that there's some, some data out there that, that patients may begin forming collaterals uh, about two to four weeks, early collaterals, after having a liver transplant. Um, so potentially these patients have, have a little bit of reserve and you can get away with following them. This is uh, from our. This is from our Mount Sinai. We actually have this fantastic uh, uh, book that was uh, published by, by our group here, and some of our, our surgeons have contributed to. And this is the treatment algorithm that's uh, that's suggested in this textbook, and it uh, echoes kind of what I've what I've talked about. So I think it's a good resource for for us to to have and to to look to for how we practice locally. Um, I just want to make and kind of highlight this point that. Um, there is, there is obviously a drastic decline in graft function, um, and, and this occurs very early. As I mentioned, you know, early hepatic artery thrombosis, we often need to retransplant the patient. So clearly there is, there is very poor uh, graft survival. Um, but these patients also uh, do not well, do not do well. So, so even though ma many of these patients are retransplanted, um, there, there is, you know, uh, uh, worse patient survival uh, following this, this event. Mm -hmm. One other yeah. important point is going back to what you were talking about the collateral vessel formation. Mm -hmm. So very often, if you get a Doppler ultrasound, you may see a, a patent hepatic artery, but the Doppler may actually be picking up the, the collateral mm -hmm. vessel formation. So if you have someone who you suspect has a hepatic artery problem in biliary ischemia and on Doppler, their artery appears open. You, you really need to do a with either MR or CT angio that would set the Absolutely. Um, I just, I quickly want to touch on this. This was, uh, you know, a question that came up using aspirin to to uh, prevent hepatic mm -hmm. artery thrombosis. So this is actually a, it's an older study, but but um, there's some physicians from, from Mount Sinai involved in it. Um, and this is not a randomized control study. Um, it's sort of a, almost a natural history study where pattern of practice uh, changed and they were able to look at a, a series of patients uh, who had, uh, who were treated with aspirin and, and those who were not. This is both adults and pediatric population. Um, but in this study, there was actually, there was no uh, significant difference between those treated with and without aspirin. However, the rates of uh, bleeding, which is reported later in the patient, uh, in the paper, were also uh, uh, not different. I know this is a, a pattern of practice, and I, I was trying to find, while I was looking, you know, good uh, randomized controlled trials that, that compare aspirin to no aspirin for hepatic artery thrombosis and stenosis, and I'm pretty sure they don't exist. I, I looked uh, pretty hard, and this was, this was the best thing I could find. So uh, I know this is still a pattern of practice in most transplant centers, um, and, and this paper reassured me that the, you know, that the complications from doing this, bleeding rates, are, are not different between the two groups, but we may not get uh, a lot of uh, benefit, at least when it comes to hepatic artery thrombosis. It doesn't necessarily speak on the other vascular complications with aspirin. So I want to move on, quickly touch on uh, hepatic artery stenosis. Um, so this is defined as a 50% narrowing on angiogram. Again, most uh, commonly occurs at the arterial anastomosis. 
Um, this will more commonly present late, um, and it is less likely to progress to, to uh, graft failure um, compared to early uh, hepatic artery thrombosis, that is. Um, uh, so this will, will typically present later. The, the onset can be a little more uh, insidious. The majority of patients are, are asymptomatic and are actually picked up with deranged uh, liver enzymes. Um, we do get biliary complications with this, but they are, they are fewer than with uh, hepatic artery thrombosis. Um, unfortunately, this can predispose uh, patients to develop hepatic artery thrombosis. This can actually occur at the site of stenosis. Um, we diagnose it the same way, Doppler ultrasound followed by angiography. Um, again, using our resistive indices uh, to, to make the diagnosis, and you have a higher peak systolic velocity as that area becomes uh, more narrow. Um, right. Yeah. You know, I would say that this is a relatively common you know, situation that you'll see mm. as, as a differential for rejection. Mm. You know, they have elevated the patient's been fine, their yeah. lungs have been stable, you know, they're, they're following them three months, six months, and all of a sudden their, their numbers go up. Yeah. Worry about rejection or CMV, you know, the usual stuff. That's why we always have to do an ultrasound before we right. just start sticking a needle in the patient. So it's like you know, right. five, ten percent of the time. Right. And so those pulse like, patients who are coming yeah, in. And it's always important to talk to the surgeon and, and you know get a multidisciplinary approach. But you know, you'll see this more than you, you would expect. Yeah. So, and oftentimes it's a good thing. Absolutely. Just watching. Just watching, yeah. So uh, you know. I'm going to talk about some of the, the uh, interventional uh, procedures that, that are used here. I already alluded to some. These are the same uh, photos from before um, where, where there is a stenosis underlying the thrombosis. But um, you know, for many of these patients, particularly if, if they are symptomatic with, with biliary complications, bilomas, and so on, you know, it's essential to revascularize. Um, so we typically favor an endovascular approach. Um, there's one case series looking at a combo approach, uh, balloon angiography angioplasty followed by stent deployment and it has a pretty good uh, rate of success but you can have immediate complications like rupture dissection and then delayed complications like reoccurrence of the stenosis or, or thrombosis occurring at the site of intervention um, surgical uh, techniques may be applied if, if endovascular techniques fail um, there's a large case series um, by, that, that's published in transplantation from 1997, so getting a little bit older. Uh, but many of the patients who go on to require surgical fix from this don't, don't have as good outcomes um, with, with uh, you know, only 67% of the patients having normalization of their, of their liver enzymes at two years, and many of the patients requiring uh, retransplantation. Uh, I want to touch on pseudoaneurysm very quickly. Uh, this is a more uncommon consequence of uh, liver transplant. Um, it can present uh, dramatically with sepsis, or if uh, there's rupture, it can present as uh, massive intraperitoneal bleeding. It can be associated with, uh, you can have mycotic uh, <coughs> pseudoaneurysms. Majority uh, present fairly early, within two months, and uh, will often require surgery, but uh, may be temporized with uh, an endovascular IR-based approach with coiling. Uh, moving on to quickly go through venous inflow complications, uh, most common being portal vein thrombosis is where I'll focus most of my time. Um, portal venous thrombosis is a rare event after transplant, more rare than, than hepatic arterial problems, occurs with an incidence of about 2%. Um, you know, again, this will commonly occur at the site of anastomosis. We, again, will classify this as being early, less than 30 days, or late, greater than 30 days. Uh, it can be related to technical error. Um, uh, you know, issues in surgery, a small di diameter of the portal vein, um, pediatric patients, this is more common, um, or patient factors. So if there's a pre-existing uh, portal venous thrombus, um, if they have a hypercoagulable state, you may see this uh, more frequently. Uh, again, this will present quite differently depending on the onset of timing. So if, uh, if, it, if it presents acutely, um, patients may develop multi-organ failure, they may develop liver failure. Um, and very poor outcomes without treatment. Whereas if this prevents, uh, presents a little bit later, um, it will, will commonly present as, as portal hypertension, unless the patient has developed collaterals or cavernous uh, transformation, uh, in which case they may be you know, asymptomatic, and this may be something that you just picked up incidentally on imaging. Um, so our, our diagnostic algorithm is, is, you'll notice the theme, very similar, Doppler ultrasound followed by uh, angiography, either direct or with uh, cross-sectional imaging. And the optimal treatment for this uh, depends on timing and symptoms. 
So if the patient presents with this subacutely, basically, you know, immediately after transplant, in the 72 hours after transplant, um, with you know signs of sepsis or multi-organ failure, uh, they typically, they frequently will need uh, surgery. Um, they, they may receive systemic anticoagulation uh, leading up to that point, but ultimately will require surgical exploration uh, where the surgeons will, will attempt thrombectomy and anastomotic uh, revision. Uh, if we see patients, you know, in the subacute phase, um, you know, more than three days out from the transplant up to, up to 30 days after the transplant, uh, you may be able to get away with um, percutaneous options. So, you know, percutaneous uh, thrombolysis can be, can be attempted via TIPS, um, or we can actually attempt, uh, you know, again, the combination uh, balloon angioplasty with, with uh, stent placement, uh, again, uh, with or without TIPS. The late PVTs, as I alluded to, will depend a little bit on how the patient presents. The patient presents uh, with this being an incidental finding and has clear cavernous transformation or presence of collaterals, mm -hmm. uh, you may be able to get away just by observing the patient, following the liver numbers, um, making sure they don't develop uh, sequelae of portal hypertension. Um, conversely, if they, if they have uh, uh, portal hypertension, you may need to talk to IR about uh, revascularization options. So again, we have our, our Mount Sinai algorithm uh, for this. And you, know, you can see that I think this is probably the most uh, important thing to take note of, and this is uh, you know what I mentioned in the slide before. If this occurs immediately after transplant, uh, many of these patients are, are, are going to need to go back to the OR and have a have a direct revision of their uh, portal venous anastomosis. Uh, have you seen any data about um, stent placement? Um, or portal vein issues? Because my understanding here is that we try to avoid that because the portal vein flow. Mm. You have this poor flow system, and you put a stent in there, you get mm. after five. Yeah. It tends to re I, I, I did Different not, yeah. I didn't see that on that, but that's uh, that's interesting. So they will, they'll do a TIPS, but at the actual site of, an, of um, anastomosis here, they'll they'll do balloon and uh, thrombolysis. Yeah, and you point why, why the TIPS and not the balloon. Yeah. Or, or they have, um, they that? I mean, I, I think here for a portal vein stenosis, they may stent it. Like for a portal vein thrombosis, I, I, I think they would just be they would thrombolysis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tips in the post transplant liver is there are a lot of problems seemingly associated with it. So I, I think they would go right to the OR for a thrombosis, but a stenosis they would stent. So I'll, I'll just touch on outflow complications. Um, and uh, as I alluded to, we have differences in how this connection is made. So we have the piggyback connection, which I defined, the more classic uh, intercable connection. Um, complications that can occur here, uh, this, is, this is more rare than the other, uh, than inflow complications, but, but can occur uh, in up to 6% of patients after, after liver transplant. Um, again, you know, this, this is very frequently related to, to technical error, um, whether that's a technical error at the anastomosis, whether it's allograft positioning, you can actually have allograft rotation uh, that leads to this. Um, you know, in terms of larger technical factors, piggyback um, and pediatric uh, trans uh, transplants are, are more associated with this complication um, because you're, you're, the surgeons are dealing with smaller vessels and it's, uh, you know, a more difficult anastomosis to make. Um, and of course, patients in, you know, with hypercoagulable state, uh, you know, with, with previous bud chiari or extrahepatic PVT before transplant would be at higher risk uh, for developing this. Um, the, the clinical presentation of this is a little bit distinct and I think interesting to, to take note of. Um, so these patients can develop, you know, hepatic outflow um, obstruction and as a result can develop a very rapid uh, hepat hepatomegaly and accumulation of ascites. Um, and interestingly, you know, some of these patients, if, if there is involvement of the, of the IVC, um, they can develop very acute lower limb edemia, edema and uh, azotemia or, or acute kidney injury. And this may be from, from IVC obstruction. And compression can occur in these patients. You can actually have secondary compression from the hepatomegaly, from the transplanted graft, uh, compressing upon the IVC itself and preventing uh, venous return to the heart. Um, so again, we have our, our similar diagnostic algorithm. Um, on Doppler ultrasound, you may see loss of uh, uh, cardiac pulsatility, and then you proceed with your angiography to, to clinch the diagnosis.
another way of putting it, so yeah. secondary blood carrier. Secondary blood carrier, yeah, from the graft itself. Yeah. Um, so, so the way we treat this, uh, you know, again, in the immediate post-transplant phase, many of these patients have to go back to the OR for a reoperation. They may have to, uh, you know, do some detorsion on the graft or detwist it. Uh, thrombectomy may be may be performed if that's developed at the outflow. Um, whereas at, uh, you know, at all other time points, um, there's actually a, a good rate of success uh, with angioplasty um, and uh, using balloon dilation. So you know, at later time points, I think it is reasonable to talk to IR about these cases. Um, you know, there's good immediate success with this, but there is unfortunately a high rate of, of um, re, uh, sort of re-stenosis. So they frequently will, will require multiple rounds of treatment from IR um, before, before they're off the hook. Uh, and patients where this is incidentally discovered or who are asymptomatic uh, may be managed expectantly or, or simply followed along. Um, so moving along now, this is, uh, I want to go through some of the most common biliary complications of liver transplant, and I want to do the second because, you know, a risk factor for many of these complications is uh, altered, um, you know, arterial or, or vascular anatomy, and so you'll see that there is a, a relationship between many of these complications forming and, and the complications already discussed. So to remind you, these are the two flavors of uh, anastomosis that we can see. And I want to go through this basically by, by incidence uh, rate. So I want to start with, uh, with biliary strictures. And these come in two flavors. Um, we can have anastomotic or non-anastomotic uh, biliary strictures. Anastomotic strictures are more common than non-anastomotic strictures. And um, they, they have a distinct appearance on, on imaging. Um, typically, they'll, they'll be uh, single. They'll be at the anastomosis. They'll be short. Will be, be within five millimeters proximal to the anastomosis. So you won't see them extending beyond that. Conversely, non-anastomotic strictures, uh, which are a minority, will be um, potentially longer. They may be more than five millimeters proximal to the anastomosis, and there may be multiple. Um, the etiology uh, of strictures, uh, to, you know, there, there potentially are, are multiple contributing factors. But what we see with with anastomotic stricture, um, when this presents early. We will see technical or surgical issues uh, leading to the development of an anastomotic stricture. So, you know, a problem at the, at the anastomosis itself within the bile ducts. Um, we may see, you know, local ischemia, um, uh, which, which can lead to the development of, of a later hepatic artery, or sorry, a bile duct stenosis. Um, and then some of these technical factors like small caliber bile ducts, which require more uh, fine anastomoses, and the colidoco jejunal anastomosis. Uh, will more fre frequently um, cause stricturing. Uh, for non-anastomotic strictures, if this uh, presents early, uh, this may be a sign that, that the patient has uh, hepatic artery stenosis. So you recall, you know, the, the, the blood supply uh, in the post-transplanted liver, uh, especially before collaterals start to form, is almost uh, completely from the, from the hepatic artery supplying the bile ducts. So if, if that's knocked out or decreased, you can have multiple areas within the bile ducts that are that are becoming damaged and potentially stricturing down. Um, again, we, we can have some of these micro angiopathic stresses like prolonged ischemia time or patients who are uh, DCD mm -hmm. donated after cardiac death that, that may be predisposed to early non-anastomotic strictures. Um, whereas patients where these non-anastomotic or longer multiple strictures present late, may be more uh, patients who are having, you know, recurrent inflammatory or infectious disease, like our recurrent PSC patients, patients with CMV infection, um, or patients who are uh, rejecting. And, and for many of these patients, you know, there is a, these, are, these are difficult to manage, and it can be associated with a poor prognosis. I know there's, there's some patients on service now that, that, that are dealing with some of these issues on the post-transplant. It's a, you know, a real, real challenge to treat some of these patients. So, Any questions? Yeah. Are there ever PSU-related strictures in the <coughs> bile duct? That's a, that's a good question. I mean, I, I would imagine, I didn't see that reported in my reading, but I, but I imagine, you know, that would potentially be something that, you know, the, 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 the surgical team at the time of, of organ procurement might identify and, you know, that well, may cause them to do a colidoco jejunal. Yeah, yeah. PSC is basically mediated, probably directed only at some host antigen in the bile duct, so I'd be surprised, but 
maybe not. Maybe it's a, a ubiquitous uh, biliary antigen that might, you know, you have uh, sensitized lymphocytes that are attacking the native bile duct. Do they also attack the transplanted bile duct? Yeah. I don't think so. I mean, I, I think that um, uh, I, I can't recall seeing a patient that has extra hepatic follow up with recurrent PFC because you always have this issue about whether, you know, in, in essence, it's an emasculotic stricture. Right? Oh, right. So um, I think it's, it's maybe impossible to really tell. But I think it's You've only never seen like a post an emasculotic stricture. Yeah. So um, to work these up, uh, you know, we need to have a, a degree of suspicion uh, that these are that these are occurring. Um, we, you know, it may not be as as simple to diagnose as some of the vascular complications where where you know you have a characteristic finding on the Doppler ultrasound, you move on to do your angiography. Here we have to have uh, some degree of suspicion that this is occurring. So you know, these patients will present with uh, you know basically a cholangitic uh, picture. Um, so they can have fever, sepsis, abdominal pain. Um, elevated liver enzymes. You know, a Doppler ultrasound, as as we mentioned, is is almost always done anyways as an initial test. And you may you may uh, get lucky. You may see some some biliary dilation or an area of stricturing. Um, but but really, if you want to make this diagnosis, you kind of have to to decide what your degree of suspicion is. Um, and I think about this the same way that 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 I think about diagnosing. You know, coli. Uh, you know bile duct stones in, in GI, if you have sort of a moderate or lower degree of suspicion, you want to choose a test that is non-invasive, um, but, but you know, will still get you the diagnosis. And in this case, that's the MRCP. Um, you know, this can define an area of biliary stricture. Um, but, you know, there's some problems with it. it can, you can have artifact from clips, uh, post-surgical changes. And, and of course, you, you know, you can't apply any uh, direct therapy once you find it at, at the time of that test. So if you have a higher degree of suspicion, um, the test for diagnosis and, and treatment ultimately will be an ERCP. Um, some patients will have this device known as a, a T-tube indwelling. I don't think we, I think we're seeing it less and less frequently, um, but it is a, you know, an indwelling tube that the surgeons will leave at the site of biliary anastomosis at the time of surgery. If that's there, you can perform a direct cholangiogram, which can sometimes show you uh, an area of stricturing. Um, and the T-tube itself can actually lead to biliary complications, including bile leaks that I'll mention in a moment. Um, if you make this diagnosis on ERCP, um, you, you should always move on to perform dedicated vascular uh, imaging because of that association between, you know, um, uh, either hepatic artery stenosis or hepatic artery thrombosis and the development of, of this. So you can see here on, this is a ERCP scope. This is a, um, a cholangiogram from the ERCP. You can see an area of narrowing of uh, stricturing at it at the anastomosis. So ERCP is a mainstay of treatment. Um, there's data that shows dilation plus stents is superior to, to dilation alone. Uh, so, so this is the standard of treatment. Um, this, is, this is classically done with multiple rounds of plastic stenting. And for us looking after these patients, it's, it's important to remember that plastic stents need to be changed. Uh, if they're left in, uh, you can have infectious complications, patients can block off, you can develop cholangitis. Um, so often these patients need multiple rounds of ERCPs, and with each round of ERCP, often multiple plastic stents are placed. Um, so there's actually uh, some data showing that, that more stents is associated with a, a greater probability of, of resolution of the area of stenosis. Um, and you can see some photos when you look into the literature of this and, and probably in some patient charts where, where you just have, you know, four or five plastic stents coming out of the, uh, out of the ampulla and, and this, is, this, is, this is how we treat this condition. Um, some people have looked at self-expanding metal stents, uh, which have not been shown to be superior, maybe associated with higher uh, rates of infection or migration. Um, and uh, so if, if you make this diagnosis and you treat it with the RCP, there are high rates of resolution. Um, unfortunately, non-anastomotic strictures, this is not the case. Uh, these, are, these are more challenging to deal with. Um, if, if there is early hepatic artery uh, thrombosis, you can revascularize um, and, and see if this solves the issue. Although, as, as we've <laughs> talked about, you may still be left with the biliary complications. And therefore, many of these patients do require uh, re-transplantation. 
if it's late hepatic artery thrombosis, you know, the damage may be well in place and, and you know, you can attempt ERCP, but, but many of these strictures will be on higher order ducts. You won't be able to access them with the, uh, the scope and you won't be able to apply plastic stents. Um, and so, so many of these patients will, will ultimately require retransplant. Moving on to, to touch on bile leaks and uh, biolomas. I've lumped these uh, uh, together as they often uh, occur together, have similar risk factors. Um, bile leaks usually occur at areas where, where there's been anatomical anatomic disruption. So site of anastomosis, if they have one of these indwelling T tubes, it can it can occur at that site, um, or it can actually occur on the on the cut surface of the mm -hmm. liver. You can have a bile leak occurring there. Again, these can present early or late with uh, different risk factors uh, for each. Early, more related to technical surgical problems, local ischemia, or as late uh, can be can be associated with the T tube removal or late hepatic artery thrombosis. Um, these patients, uh, so so bile within the abdomen is is painful, and it's. Um, it's important to, to, to know that when you're, when you're thinking about this condition. Patients uh, should not have a benign abdominal exam if they have a bile leak. Uh, however, many of these patients are also on steroids and we know that, you know, that can actually, that can mask this. So if you have a high degree of suspicion, um, you can actually perform a diagnostic paracentesis that can be sent for, for bile. You can see if it's uh, bilious ascites um, and, and that may clue you off to, to look a little more into whether the patient is having a bile leak. This is decreasing in incidence, and it's felt to be related to fewer and fewer T-tubes being used um, these days by surgeons. Um, so a CT or MRI may show the presence of a bioloma, um, but won't show you whether an active bile leak is occurring. Ultrasound is probably much less useful in this situation. Not as good at, at showing sort of uh, intra-abdominal collections. Um, so you really need to, to do an invasive test, either an ERCP or a cholangiogram for definitive diagnosis. Um, so this is a patient who actually has a, a T-tube in place and has a tracking bile leak. Uh, you can see this is a bile leak after the T-tube's been removed. And so the, the, um, the uh, endoscopist is uh, shooting dye and, and we have a, a bile leak occurring at the site of uh, the T-tube. Um, so, you know, you do kind of have to have a high degree of suspicion to chase down and make this diagnosis because it requires an interventional procedure. So it's important to, to, to keep that in mind when you're, when you're suspecting this. Um, our management of this, again, we have a Mount Sinai algorithm for this. Um, in patients where, you know, they've, they've had that direct duct-to-duct -duct anastomosis, uh, you can usually get away with ERCP. Um, and the idea of this is to provide a, a path of sort of lower resistance through the form of a stent uh, to allow bile to flow past the area of leak. Um, this is, this is uh, successful in, in many cases. However, uh, immediate post-op bile leaks uh, may also be monitored before you know, deciding to intervene upon at the uh, sort of, um, this is something you know, that, that we would consult surgeons with and, and decide whether this would be a case that would need emergent ERCP stenting or whether you could watch it. Um, in patients who have a uh, sort of uh, um, colodoco jejunostomy or duct to bowel anastomosis, um, they may require PTC, so a percutaneous um, a tube, to actually make the diagnosis, shoot the contrast, and see if there's a leak, and then for uh, treatment as well, because you're not able to actually access the bile ducts with, uh, with ERCP. And that's uh, because of that long rule limb that I mentioned right off the top. It can be challenging for some endoscopists to actually make it all the way back up that rule limb to get to where, the, uh, where they need to for stent placement. And this is uh, one, other, one other point. I've never actually, I haven't seen this done in practice, but if, but if you are unable to access the, uh, the, the bile ducts with the ERCP scope to make this diagnosis, the patient has good liver function, you can theoretically perform a, a HIDA scan. Um, and if it's positive, then, then you've made your diagnosis. But it's important to be aware that, that many patients, especially those post-transplant, may not have normal liver function. And, and HIDA relies on the, the normal production and flow of bile. Um, so if you have a negative HIDA scan, it may not be um, as helpful. And, and, and that shouldn't cause you to, to forget about this diagnosis if it's negative. And importantly, if biolomas develop as a result of this, they typically need uh, percutaneous drainage and antibiotics. Um, 
So briefly touching on the last few complications that can occur here, um, stones and sludge are seen at a higher rate post liver transplant than they are in the non liver transplant mm -hmm. population. Um, you know, the reasons for this are, are multiple, but they may occur at, at sites of uh, stricturing at the, you know, bile anastomosis or or non-anastomotic strictures. And actually, uh, calcineurin inhibitors um, are, are associated with reduced, or are lipogenic and associated with reduced bile flow. So patients who are on CNIs may have a propensity to form stones or sludge. Um, so it's important to be aware of that. Um, uh, biliary cast syndrome um, will commonly occur in the setting of ischemia. Um, and, and this can occur where we have diffuse stricturing within the hilum. We actually have sloughing of the, of the you know, biliary um, and, and, and collection of casts within the uh, proximal, uh, or sorry, distal bile, bile ducts. And these are difficult to treat, can require multiple rounds of ERCP and sometimes PTC. Uh, hemobilia, bleeding uh, from the bile ducts we may see after PTC or biopsy, typically will require IR intervention. And then mucosal is a very uh, rare, unusual complication after a uh, liver transplant and can occur at sort of the, the uh, where the, the site of the, um, Vaticolisystectomy. So, if you have a cut um, cystic duct, you can have accumulation of mucus at that cystic duct remnant, and this can form into sort of a uh, ball of mucus that can cause uh, extrinsic compression on the common bile duct or uh, infection, and uh, is usually uh, requiring surgery to be dealt with. ARCP is uh, often not suggested for those patients. So that takes us uh, to the end of the talk, and I want to thank you for your uh, attention and um, any questions uh, you might have, I can answer. This is this is Vancouver. This is Vancouver General Hospital, uh, where I did my GI and uh, internal medicine training. Thanks, Rob. Beautiful picture. Questions? No questions. A lot of questions on the transplant boards yeah. from, from your talk. Send it to the uh, to the guys. This is a great talk for you to use again. Yeah, very very comprehensive. I mean, I agree. I mean, all those questions are going to be on your boards. So yeah, very crucial. I mean, I think what Tom was saying uh, about you know, hemming and hawing about oh, is the liver okay? You put in a lot of effort to get this liver yeah. to transplant them. Is is our practice has been we've seen patients disasters who wait seven to ten days to try to get the appeal. Hmm. Right. Right. Is there and anything known about the lipo lipogenicity of bile after transplant? Is it any more lipogenic? So the, the the only suggestion I saw of that was it was in the context of um, calcineurin inhibitors. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure if there's something and the comparator group in those series is, is patients who are not on calcineurin. Right. So I'm not sure. Uh, I should go back and look at the rates yeah. and that you know. I'm not sure if there's something in, intrinsic beyond the uh, presence of biliary anastomoses, uh, but but lithogenic. I'm 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 not yeah, sure about that. I don't, I don't know, and I don't know if that like for example, might be helpful in terms of bile flow. Yeah, I mean it. Yeah, patients with a with a rulim potentially because I, I know you you might have some altered. Uh, of course, the gallbladder comes out, so yeah. That's not Great job. Thanks, Rob. Thanks. Thanks.